Hey, welcome back to Space But Messier. I'm Tony, your host. Today we'll be talking about how Copernicus, Tycho, and Kepler changed the Earth-centered model of the universe. Now, the ideas introduced by Copernicus fundamentally changed the way we perceive our place in the universe. The story of this dramatic change, known as the Copernican Revolution, is in many ways the story of the origin of modern science. It's also the story of several key personalities, beginning with Copernicus himself. Now, Copernicus was born in Torin, Poland on February 19th, 1473. His family was wealthy, and he received an education in mathematics, medicine, and law. He began studying astronomy in his late teens. Now, by that time, tables of planetary motion based on the Ptolemaic model from last video became super inaccurate, but few people were willing to undertake the difficult calculations required to revise those tables. Now, the best tables available had been compiled some 200 years earlier under the guidance of Spanish monarch Alfonso X. Commenting on the tedious nature of the work, the monarch is said to have complained, if I had been present at the creation of the universe, I would have recommended a simpler design. <laughs> so in his quest for a better way to predict planetary positions, Copernicus decided to try Aristarchus's sun-centered idea, first proposed more than 1700 years earlier. He had read of Aristarchus's work and recognized a much simpler explanation for the apparent retrograde motion offered by a sun-centered system. But he went far beyond Aristarchus in working out the mathematical details of this model. And through this process, Copernicus discovered simple geometric relationships that allowed him to calculate each planet's orbital period around the sun and its relative distance from the sun in terms of the Earth-Sun distance, or the astronomical unit. The model's success in providing a geometric layout for the solar system convinced him that the sun-centered idea must be correct. Now, Copernicus was nevertheless hesitant to publish his work, fearing that his suggestion that Earth moved would be considered absolutely absurd. However, he discussed his system with other scholars, including high-ranking officials of the Catholic Church, who urged him to publish a book. And Copernicus saw the first printed copy of his book De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium? On the Revolutions of Heavenly Spheres, sorry. On the day he died, May 24th, 1543. He didn't even get to see the book till he died. The day he died. So publication of the book spread the sun-centered idea super widely, and many scholars were drawn to his aesthetic advantages. However, the Copernican model gained only few converts over the next like 50 years for a good reason. It didn't really work that well for all the credit we give him. The primary problem was that while Copernicus had been willing to overturn Earth's central place in the cosmos, he held fast to the ancient belief that heavenly motion must occur in perfect circles. Now, this incorrect assumption forced him to add numerous complexities to the system, including the circle on circle thing, uh, much like those used by Ptolemy and stuff like that. And in the end, his complete model was no more accurate and no less complex than the Ptolemaic model, and few people were willing to throw out thousands of years of tradition for a new model that worked just as poorly as the old one. Can you blame them? Now, part of the difficulty faced by astronomers who sought to improve either the Ptolemaic or the Copernican model was a lack of quality data. The telescope had not yet been invented, and existing naked eye observations were not super accurate. Better data were needed, and they were provided by the Danish nobleman Tycho Brahe, or usually just known by Tycho. Tycho was an eccentric genius who lost part of his nose in a sword fight with another student over who was the better mathematician. Then he designed a replacement nose made of silver and gold. In 1563, Tycho decided to observe a wildly anticipated alignment of Jupiter and Saturn. To his surprise, the alignment occurred nearly two days later than the date Copernicus had predicted. Resolving to improve the state of astronomical prediction, he set about compiling careful observations of stellar and planetary positions in the sky. Now, Tycho's fame finally grew after he observed what he called a nova, meaning new star, in 1572. And its lack of observable parallax led Tycho to conclude that the nova was much further away than the moon, a fact that contradicted the ancient Greek belief in unchanging heavens. Today, we know that Tycho saw a supernova, or the explosion of a distant star. Now, in 1577, Tycho made a similar observation of a comet, and showed that it too lay on the realm of the heavens, or super far away. Others, including Aristotle, had argued that comets were a phenomenon of Earth's atmosphere. King Frederick II of Denmark decided to sponsor Tycho's ongoing work, giving him money to build an unparalleled observatory for the naked eye observations. Then, after Frederick II died in 1588, 
Tycho moved to Prague, where his work was supported by German Emperor Rudolf II. And over a period of three decades, Tycho and his assistants compiled naked eye observations, that means without a telescope, accurate to within less than one arc minute. That's less than the thickness of a fingernail viewed at arm's length. So despite the quality of his observations, Tycho never succeeded with coming up with satisfying explanation for planetary motion. He was convinced that the planets must orbit the sun, but this inability to detect stellar parallax led him to conclude that Earth must remain stationary. He therefore advocated a model in which the sun orbits the Earth while all other planets orbit the sun. Few people took this model seriously, actually, believe it or not. Tycho failed to explain the motions of the planets well, but he succeeded in finding someone who could. In 1600, he hired the young German astronomer Johannes Kepler. Kepler and Tycho had a strained relationship, but Tycho recognized the talent of his young apprentice. In 1601, as he lay on his deathbed because he held his bladder too long. Yeah, true story. So bad. I'm not laughing. He held his bladder too long because he was at a dinner party and it was not polite to get up during dinner and go to the bathroom. So he held it, got a bladder infection and died, basically. So anyway, in 1601, as he lay on his deathbed, Tycho begged Kepler to find a system that would make sense of his observations so that it may not appear that I have lived in vain. Quote. Now, Kepler was deeply religious and believed that understanding the geometry of the heavens would bring him closer to God. Kind of cool. And like Copernicus, he believed that planetary orbits should be perfect circles. So he worked diligently to match circular motions to Tycho's observations. Now, Kepler worked super hard to find an orbit for Mars, which posed the greatest difficulty in matching the data for a circular orbit. And after years of calculation, Kepler finally found a circular orbit that matched all Tycho's observations of Mars's position along the ecliptic to within two arc minutes, a small. However, the model did not correctly predict Mars's position north or south of the ecliptic. Because Kepler sought a physically realistic orbit for Mars, he could not, as Ptolemy and Copernicus had done, he could not tolerate one model for the east to west positions and another for the north to south positions. He attempted to find a unified model with a circular orbit, and in doing so, he found that some of his predictions differed from Tycho's observations by as much as eight arc minutes, which is a lot. Kepler surely was tempted to attribute these errors to Tycho. After all, eight arc minutes is barely one fourth the angular diameter of the full moon. But Kepler trusted Tycho's work. The small discrepancies finally led Kepler to abandon the idea of circular orbits and find the correct solution to the ancient riddle of planetary motion. About this, Kepler wrote, if I had believed that we could ignore these eight minutes of arc, I would have patched up my hypothesis accordingly. But since it was not permissible to ignore, those eight minutes pointed the road to a complete reformation in astronomy. Now his key discovery was that planetary orbits are not circles, but instead a special type of oval called an ellipse. And in the next episode, we're going to be diving deep into Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So thank you so much for joining today. If you'd like to support this channel, please like, subscribe, and comment to share your thoughts or any questions that you have. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.